Hi everybody and welcome back to Miss Angler's biology class. I am Miss Angler and in today's video we are going to look at the nervous system. This is an introductory video so I'm going to run you through the basics, the functions, how to identify the different structures and most importantly I'm going to run through the things you need to know for your exam. Now if you are new here don't forget to give this a video a thumbs up and subscribe and make sure your notifications are turned on because I post new videos every Tuesday and Thursday. Now starting off with the basics, you are going to need to know what exactly is the function of the nervous system. And the function of the nervous system can be summarized into a very simple flow diagram. And I'd like to also point out that you can use this flow diagram to explain any response that happens in the nervous system. Anything About to draw for you is you can use this also to explain your endocrine system as well. So in any kind of system where there is a response to um, some kind of external environment, we always start our story with some kind of stimulus. Now a stimulus um, in the nervous system could be something like light, it could be pain, it could be sound, and whatever the stimulus is, it needs to be received by someone. So that incoming stimulus is going to be sensed to some kind of sensory receptor. And that is generally a sensory set of cells, maybe in the eye, in the ear, in the skin. They receive that information. Now, after that, that information needs to be sent to someone. And in this diagram, we are only going to focus on the central nervous system. And the central nervous system is responsible for taking in this information and it needs to make a decision. And so when we speak about these decisions from the central nervous system, we call it its integrative function. In other words, uh, your central nervous system decides what's going to happen next. So your brain and your spinal cord make a decision. Are we going to blink? Are we going to run away? What are we going to do? Now, once we've made that decision, we need to send that decision to somebody uh, who is going to carry out the response. And so we call these structures effectors. They are generally muscles or glands, and they respond to this instruction, and they follow out, and they create some kind of response, which is our final portion of our flow diagram here. Responses can be things like increasing the rate of digestion or maybe decreasing it. Maybe it increases your heart rate. And so effectively in that example, the effector would be the heart and increasing the heart rate would be the response. And so this is how you would explain how the nervous system functions in order to bring about a change within the body due to some kind of external stimulus. Now let's get into the structures that make up the central nervous system. And when I speak about the central nervous system, I'm speaking about the brain and the spinal cord. Now sitting around the brain and spinal cord are structures called meninges, which are protective layers that sit around the brain. Now this is a little cross section through a piece of brain as well as some protective layers. So this gray area over here represents the brain on either side. And I'm going to start off with the outside layers first. So this outer layer that we see over here is actually your skin. Then sitting just below that is the bone of the skull. And then there are three protective layers that sit underneath that in order to protect your brain as well as your spinal cord. We start with the most outer layer, which is this thick tough blue layer. It is called the dura mater. It's very fibrous. It's almost like a sack that your um, brain sits in. Then sitting just below that is this area over here, which is in the sort of uh, paler blue in the middle. That is the arachnoid layer. It is where all your blood vessels are found. And then the most inner meninge, which sits right up against the actual brain itself, it's a very delicate layer, is called the pia mater. 
Now, the pia mater is a very delicate layer, and altogether the meninges are protective layers around both the spinal cord as well as the brain. And so when we talk about the function of the meninges, we say they are there for protection, and they also allow for cerebrospinal fluid to be secreted. And cerebrospinal fluid assists with lubrication, but also with protection, making sure that your brain is well secured. We're starting off with the main component of your central nervous system, which is the brain. And the brain has regions to it. And um, first of all, we're going to start off with the largest part of your brain, which is this folded area on the outside of your brain, which is called the cerebrum. And the cerebrum is essentially where you live in the sense that it's your personality, it's your memories, and all of those folds and grooves are called silky and gyri. And essentially, that is where all of your sight comes from, your hearing, your memories, everything is housed in this part of your brain. And so when we list the functions of the cerebrum, we say it's where voluntary movement comes from. So like walking and um, exercising and moving around. It's also where your senses are, as I mentioned, and most importantly, your cognitive function. It's where your intelligence is. Then sitting at the bottom or the lower underside of your brain is this uh, gray area at the back here. This is called the cerebellum. Now, the cerebellum is quite an old region of your brain, um, and in different animals, it's different sizes. Um, and that is something to do with the complexity of the animal. Our cerebellum is a little bit smaller because we have such a large uh, cerebrum, but the function of the cerebellum is it coordinates your voluntary movement. In other words, if you want to walk nice and smoothly, um, the cerebellum is responsible for that and make sure that you can walk in a nice straight line and that it's a smooth movement that's not jerky. It also maintains your muscle tone. Now, understand muscle tone doesn't mean your muscles look good or toned. What it means is, is that your muscle Muscles have some firmness to it when you're awake so that your muscles can keep you upright and stable. And that links into the last function, which is posture and balance. Your cerebellum plays a really important role for understanding where is your head in relation to your body when you're moving, but also when you are moving and you're walking to keep you in a straight line, the cerebellum makes sure that you continue to do that. Now, in order to see the rest of the components of the brain, we're going to have to cut it open so we can see on the inside. And here is a lovely cross-section through the cerebellum at the bottom here, as well as seeing a cross-section through the cerebrum on the top. But the next structure I want to bring attention to is this pink structure over here. This is called the corpus callosum. Now, the brain is actually divided into two hemispheres or two halves, a left and a right hemisphere. Each hemisphere uh, controls the opposite side of your body. So the left controls your right and your right controls your left. And the function of the corpus callosum is to make sure that there is good communication between these two hemispheres. It ensures that the left-hand side of your body knows what the right-hand side of your body is doing. Then we're going to move into this lower region of your brain, reaching down into what we call the medulla. Now, the medulla is this swollen region at the bottom. It's the medulla oblongata. And it has a really important function because this is where life actually is sustained in your brain. And you'll see now as we look through the functions, the functions include things like the pathway for impulses from your whole body, your reflex center for breathing and heart rate and so many more things, as well as less important reflexes like sneezing and coughing. If your medulla is damaged in any way, um, it can often lead to your death. Um, you don't breathe, you can't, you know, your heart doesn't beat. And so it's a really important part of the brain, often referred to as part of the brain stem. And we can call it a stem because if you look at it, this region from about here to here does look like a stem of a flower. Now, some people in some textbooks are not so sure about when you call it the medulla oblongata and when you call it the spinal cord. Well, you call it the medulla as long as you are still inside of the cranium. In other words, you haven't left the skull bone. But the moment you leave the skull bone, and let's say that's over here, that was the exit out of the skull, everything beyond that and below that is called 
the spinal cord. And a nice way to also figure that out is there is a large hole in the bottom of the cranium called the foramen magnum. It is where the spinal cord leaves the brain. And so that is the beginning of the spinal cord. If you were going backwards and upwards, it would then go from the spinal cord. And then after the foramen, it would become the medulla oblongata. Now let's move into the spinal cord, which is the second component of your central nervous system. And it's technically like the tail of the brain. It's completely attached to the brain. It is, it is a part of the brain. Um, and it extends all the way down your vertebral column. And we've cut the spinal cord in half, so you can see on the inside here. And I'm going to start with the differences in color that you'll notice. You'll see that on the inner region of your spinal cord, the matter is actually darker. So we call it gray matter versus the outer region of your spinal cord is white matter. And the difference in color is linked to something called myelin. And I will get back to that at a later video. It is a fatty substance that sits around our nervous tissue. And so the more you have of it, um, the change in color will uh, occur. Now, I'd like you to also know that when you're looking at a spinal cord like you are here, uh, on the right-hand side, so on this side over here, um, we have some spinal nerves. And these are nerves that are going to leave the spine and go to the rest of the body. I'd like you to know that there is also going to be one on this side. But for the simplicity of this video, I have just left it off so that it doesn't influence how we label the diagram. But it's technically on both sides. And so you're going to need to be able to label this particular diagram. And I'm going to start off with what these structures are over here. Now, this upper region over here where there's this a bit of a bulge is called the dorsal root. Dorsal meaning back. In other words, that is the back of your spinal cord. It is the part that is closest to your skin or where your vertebral column is. And then the other or opposite side to that, if that is the dorsal side, is what we call the ventral root. I'm also going to tell you why you need to know these um, uh, slightly later in the video, why it's important as well for later videos. The hole in the center over here is called the central canal. Um, there is some cerebrospinal fluid in there as well. And then the final thing is this structure coming out of our spinal cord, which is the spinal nerve. Now, when we speak about the spinal cord's functions, we know that it is a pathway of imp for impulses. It is where primitive reflexes exist. And when we talk about a primitive reflex, we're talking like the knee-jerk reaction or the pain response when you pull away from something that is painful. Now, the reason why we need to know the structure of the spinal cord is because in a later video, I'm going to explain a reflex arc, but just the basics for now so you can place it. When a pathway of impulse moves from your spinal nerve into your spinal cord, it is going to travel along the spinal nerve. It is going to go into the dorsal root and down into the spinal cord itself. A decision is then made in the spinal cord, um, and that's why it's called a reflex. So it actually completely just jumps the brain. And then the decision that is made leaves out the ventral root and then back down the spinal nerve once more. And this is what we call a reflex arc. I am going to do that in a lot more detail in a later video. Now that we've covered the central nervous system, which as you can see in this picture over here is the brain and the spinal cord, we now need to move into the peripheral nervous system. Peripheral comes from the word like on the periphery, like on the edges. And the peripheral nervous system is all the other nerves of the body. It is everything that runs down into your arms and your legs and to all the organs of the body. And that is divided into two types of systems again. We have the autonomic nervous system and we have the somatic nervous system. Now, we'll start with the somatic because it's the easier one and it doesn't need a lot of explanation. Somatic means body and it refers to to the nervous system that is communicating with your sense organs and your voluntary muscles. And so the somatic nervous system would be the one where you would be like moving your eyes to look somewhere. Um, you would also be walking. And so this touches on the sensory part of it as well as the motor, which is the movement part. What we're going to focus in more detail is the autonomic nervous system. And this communicates with all the systems that are automatic. In other words, you don't need to think about it. They're involuntary. They just 
happen. And you'll see now why it's important for them to just happen without you thinking about it. And the autonomic nervous system divides again into two, and it's called the sympathetic division or the parasympathetic division. Now, looking at this in the diagram, we're going to be able to apply what it actually means when we talk about the autonomic nervous system and its two divisions. And I'm going to start on the right-hand side with the sympathetic nervous system. All of the organs of the body, uh, as, long as, as well as some of the glands, are double innerviated. It means they've got two nerves going into them. And essentially, the reason why they have that is you need to be able to control how they are reacting. And so on the sympathetic side of this system, this is where we have the flight or fight response. And so if you read some of the descriptors that go down the sympathetic nervous system, if you are running away or scared of something, your pupils dilate, your heartbeat increases, um, you have an increased rate of glycogen to glucose because you need to access sugar because you need to run away. Um, and there's a decreased activity in your digestive system, you don't want to waste any energy. You'll also notice that if you look at the picture, there are direct links coming out of the spinal cord to each of these organs, and that's because the sympathetic nervous system needs to be automatic, quick, fast, get a response. On the other side, however, the parasympathetic nervous system, and the word para should give it away, it's more relaxing. And this side, we say it is a rest and digest system. And it allows your body to do just that. And you will notice that it, ha it has all the opposite functions that we saw in the sympathetic. It causes your pupils to constrict and let less lighten. Um, it slows your heart rate. Um, and essentially, the parasympathetic side is when your body is not under any stress and it's just relaxing. And these two systems are completely automatic. Uh, they are run by your brain. You don't have to think about them. They are involuntary. And most importantly, you'll also notice that there is a single nerve that is running out to most of these. And that is because when you are resting and digesting, you don't need a lot of electrical impulses to go to these structures. Once you tell them what to do, they keep doing it, and they'll do it very slowly over time. Whereas the sympathetic needs a specific nerve going to each of these regions because we want a fast reaction. Now, as always, I like to finish off my lessons with a terminology recap. Now, there was a lot of terms in this section, and there's going to be even more as we go through the eye and the ear as well. So I'm going to be very brief, but you can use these words to create flashcards. It's a great way to study for biology. So we spoke about stimulus, which is an incoming message from the external world, like sound or pain or heat. There's a receptor organ of some kind receiving that information. The integrative function is your brain making a decision. That decision is set to a effector organ like a muscle gland. And then we went into the actual central nervous system, which is made out of the brain. The brain is covered in meninges, and they are the pia mater, the arachnoid, and the dura mater. We then looked at the regions of the brain, which is the cerebrum, the corpus callosum, cerebellum, medulla oblongata, and then the final component of the central nervous system was the spinal cord. We then looked at how Besides the central nervous system, the other divisions of the nervous system, which is the peripheral nervous system, that peripheral nervous system is all the other nerves of the body. It then divided into the somatic and then the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system divided again to become the sympathetic or the parasympathetic nervous system. It's quite a lot to wrap your head around, so I suggest drawing some kind of almost diagram of a family tree or sort of a flow diagram to see how they split from one another. A very similar one that we saw in two pictures back where it had organized it very well in that flow diagram. Now, as always, if you've liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe and turn your notifications on because I post every Tuesday and Thursday and I will see you all again soon. Bye.